So we're going to talk about managing hundreds of MySQL servers efficiently. So I'm Sherry Cabral. This is my coworker Brandon. We both work for Mozilla, the database engineering team. We are two-thirds of all the database engineering at um, Mozilla. So nobody put a bomb in this room or anything. <laughs> That'd be bad. Um, so the challenge with, with doing this, um, there's a lot of them. One big one is not having any one-offs for consistency. You want to make sure everything is going to be the same. Um, you want to make sure that your configuration files are easy to manage, right? So if you decide that you want something to have a global setting, you want to be able to do it easily, and if you want to be able to override it, some machines have some settings, other machines have other settings. Maybe you want expire log days to be 10 everywhere, but maybe it's got to be three on some servers that don't have a lot of space. You have to be able to do that. Um, you want to be able to have no one-offs with scripts um, and also auxiliary files. So if you have something like you want um, swappiness to be low, on your machines, that's an operating system file. It's not really a MySQL file. In um, on Red Hat, that's in your SysControl, SysCTL. One of the other things you guys want to make sure that you have going on is that you want to avoid having the ability to deal with anything for any human interaction. You want to basically take it so that if you get an emergency call at three o'clock in the morning because a server went down, that you can copy and paste a configuration from somewhere and it moves forward into your scenario where you're not having to stop and take time to think about it. You can just simply react in an emergency situation and do things very easily. Yep, and, and the most important thing is in the case of a disaster, right, something happens, how long does it take to get another server up that's built exactly the same? Right, something, your, your hard drive melts. Well, what do you do now? You spin up another server, how long is it gonna take you to do that? If you have to go through the software CD install, it's gonna take you four hours to do that. Do you even remember what your configuration file was? If you're not managing it, um, you might end up with some surprises. You know, for example, back when AWS didn't have uh, EBS, so the Elastic Block Store, and things could just reboot at any time. Um, this, I actually see that uh, people doing much more management control, configuration management control like this is actually one of the biggest benefits that AWS has brought to, uh, to sysadmining and, and database administration. So I'm going to talk about what we do at, Mo at Mozilla, and one of the best things I think about this talk is that you can use this logic, even if you don't use Puppet, you can use some of this logic in your own systems. So for example, we don't just have one MySQL. We have uh, MySQL, we have Perconos Patch MySQL, we have MariaDB, and we have Togutech. We have all of these currently in our installation. Now we're working on consolidating them. Um, you know, we had Percona 5, 5 for a while until we realized that MariaDB had better optimization for subqueries, so we changed over to start using that. But the systems that were already on Percona 5, we didn't change over. So when we upgrade to 5, 6, right, we're going to be consolidating those all, those all. And we actually did have some MySQL 5, 5 before we had tested the Percona 5, 5. So, we're definitely working on consolidating these, but this kind of thing can be used for more than just you know, one kind of package. Um, so, and there's different versions, 5.5, 5.6. Five, you know, we've got 5.5.30, 5, 5.5.31, 5, 5, I think, in places. And so the next thing that we want to make sure of is that everywhere across the infrastructure, that everything works. I mean, when we put something in place, we need to make sure that, hey, it comes out, it rolls out, it just goes into place, falls into place, and everything goes up. You know, as Sherry mentioned, when we have a server disaster, we need to bring up a new server. When we replace that server, bring it up, and then deploy our puppetization, we need to make sure that it comes back online and it's ready to jump into the system and recover. Uh, we run at Mozilla most of our systems just N plus one. So if we have, you know, the necessary need for two read slaves, we'll only have three, really. So it's that scenario that if something goes down, it becomes, okay, we're, we're sane, we're safe, but we need to be able to move forward. Also, another nice thing is that we can have same defaults. So we go right there, for example, when we do the restores, you know, we make sure that everything falls into place. Our log file sizes, for example, when we bring up a server, those will come into store. Uh, we'll make sure that our defaults inside of what you'll see later are my.conf.erb, which is the puppet file for our template. That has all of our information. It has some pretty solid defaults. You can make one-offs for servers for different variables. Um, but for example, one of the defaults that we do is 75% of a system's memory for the InnoDB buffer pool. And that's a safe default. It's not the optimal for any server, really, but it's a safe thing that we can do if we need to throw that in there in an emergency. Something like the InnoDB log file size ensures that when we do restore a backup to a machine, no matter what backup we have, if the log file size is going to be the same, we're going to be able to restore it. Otherwise, we're going to have problems when we start trying to restore it because the log file size isn't the same. 
Um, and again, the idea is as little human knowledge as possible. Right? I don't want to have to tell Brandon, hey, by the way, when you spin up this new server, you're going to have a problem with the EnodeDB log file size. So just change the my.cnf for now to be what the file size should be. Right? There's, there's just, there isn't that silo of knowledge right? so that if somebody gets hit by a bus, it's not a big deal. You know, if somebody gets hit by a bus, you know, then the people coming in can read the public configuration file and see, okay, clearly these are the defaults they chose and this is what they did. So, um, so scripts are also really important, right? Who, who here doesn't have a script that they're using? You don't have no scripts, great. So there are backup scripts, there's ETL scripts you might be doing, um, there's data refreshes you might be doing, so maybe you're exporting from production and onto your stage thing. Maybe you're doing a lot, maybe you're doing more of these. Maybe you're exporting from production and then you're doing some ETL to sanitize your data and putting it into dev. This can all be, all your scripts or whatever can be managed without you having to deal with it. So I don't know about you, but when I, when I first came to Mozilla, they were like, oh, just spin up a new backup instance. And I was like, well, so what do I do? And they're like, well, copy all of these scripts and these files. And I'm like, are they not under configuration? Which are like, what happens if, if the if files get deleted? And they're like, oh, well, we'll just rewrite the backup scripts. That's not, you know, um, and scripts for monitoring are under puppet control as well. All right. And trending, monitoring, alerting, and trending. So not just the, the paging, but the graphing. So as you can see, we have our scripts that we can put inside of the Puppet system. Uh, we also have things that we do outside of what is involved directly in the database. For example, you know, you're sitting on your database server and you want to have things that are modified that are specifically good for database servers but not good for the rest of your environment. So inside of our module, we have things that modify things like your sysctl. Uh, we can modify your file and proc limits. We can modify swappiness. We can mod also modify your mount options. So we do things like, for example, setting no A time, no dir A time, you know, no barrier. Uh, you know, on errors, remount the RO, that kind of stuff, all inside of our mount options. So we can set all these inside of our module, and when a new database server rolls out, these get deployed to it. So that's a brief overview of what we're doing. Is there anything else that we haven't covered on that you're like, oh, what about, uh, you know, this kind of thing? How do you manage that? If there is, yeah? So do you have revision control around your scripts? So the question is, do we have revision control on our scripts? And the answer is yes. We actually have a, a subversion repository. Um, which isn't quite as old as a CDS repository, but uh, we do have a, an internal repository for it, and, uh, and we do, in fact, keep it under strict revision control, which is very, very useful as someone who just the other day had to revert back to stuff that she had done uh, earlier. So, yeah. Do you have any means for ensuring that no dynamic changes may get onto your servers without also being reflected in your puppet? So the question is, do we have any way to make sure that if somebody changes something on the machine itself that it doesn't get overwritten without knowing and, and things like that? Yes and no. We have some ways to check that. For example, PT config diff. We run that at, you know, between uh, this Percono, Percono Toolkit. It checks the config file to make sure that all the running variables are set the same. Um, that's not 100% accurate for that kind of thing. There are false negatives on that, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, things like if somebody changes the backup script, yeah, it just will overwrite it. So, um, so there is some human knowledge to let people know, like, hey, these, these files are under control and stuff. But it runs every half hour, so they find out pretty quickly and don't lose too much work. User passwords and permissions. Users passwords and permissions. Uh, do, we, do we put those in Puppet? Yes. Oh, yeah. And we have, a whole mod, we have a whole subclass just for that, just for granting things. And in fact, not only um, users and permissions, um, but databases. So if you want to create a database, we do that. Um, and we do that, for, for example, because when we use checksums, we like to have a checksum database specifically for that. So we create that database. So, uh, you guys in the so do we store passwords in the SVN? We actually use um, a tool called Hira, which H-I-E-R-A, which, which does that for us. So we didn't have to like strip out passwords from our code because they were stored in a different place. They were just variables, and we called them. Um, but yeah, we, we store those in our revision control in a different location. Yeah, so you won't see them, for example, in the Puppet module that we're showing you today. They're not in there. They're in right. another module inside of Puppet that basically is called Hira. It's a security module designed for storing passwords and things like that. Do you guys have like a, a group that is centralized from a currency standpoint, not like this, but as far as you know, the OS, the database engines? Uh, is there so the question is, is there how are, how are operating systems managed and how do we know that we're getting the, the, the latest and greatest or whatever so our script, stability is? Because, you know, yes. So the answer is yes, those are in different classes, right? So the MySQL class deals with only MySQL stuff and the subclasses, or the MySQL module, I should say, and the classes within it deal with that. 
Um, but what we'll talk about calling other classes. For example, when we do things like um, swappiness, that calls a different class. Because that, that has nothing to do with, not that it has nothing to do with MySQL, but that's an operating system le level thing. And that's different for every operating system. Okay, one one last one. Do we do a configuration based on the real hardware? Yes. Oh yeah. In Absolutely. fact, not just things like um, Brandon was mentioning. You know, to be buffer pool size, we do like a sane default of seventy-five percent of that. Um, if you haven't overridden it, but we also do things like if we have a battery back right cache, we set some things differently, right? So we can deal with more, with less thinking and kind of more less less acid compliance if we have things like battery back right cache. Yeah, and you guys will see some examples uh, and later as we get through the slides of where you can change variables based upon server hardware and things like that. We'll, we'll kind of demonstrate some of that. All right. So just to recap, we're configuring files, operating system settings, packages, and dependencies. So let's talk a little bit about dependencies. So one of the things that configuration management lets you do is have dependencies. Um, software has some dependencies. For example, your operating system version, right, is a dependency, right? So what version of MySQL are you using? Well, what version of operating system are you using, right? You have to make sure you download the right one for the right thing. There are bugs, features, and, and, and bugs and features in software. We had a problem with um, PT table checksum and locking. So we have to be using 2.1.8 until they came out with what, 2.2.1 yeah, or something? 2.2.5 allowed us to upgrade, but we just haven't so done so yet. We haven't gotten it there yet, so for now, we've, just, we've stuck there. Um, there's also compatibility. For example, in order to use um, PT table checksum 2.1.8, we had to be on Perl DVD MySQL 4.0.13. Um, I think that's for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, five. something like that. So we couldn't be on the most recent version because it didn't work with PT table checksum. So there's also hardware dependencies. Um, if we have battery back right cache, we might have some, uh, some different things. How much RAM do we have? Um, and the number of CPUs might you know, change what we do for some concurrency things. And you know, sometimes you have more than one of them. For example, our machines that have Red, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 have to use 2.1.8 and they have to use Perl DBD MySQL 4.0.22. So yeah, so before we get into the meat of things, we'll just uh, talk about the goal. Again, is to be able to spin up a new server with minimal interaction, right? So all we do is copy a, copy a manifest, which is basically an instantiation, right? So we just copy paste it. And if we want something for the exact same variable, um, actually, we don't even have to, if it's the exact same machine, we just add the name into, into what, ma what should match it. And it could be similar or exact. Maybe we're spinning up a whole new cluster, which I had to do last week, and then I just copy, pasted, changed the names of things, and I was done. So for example, we, you might say, well, we have the system, we're replacing it, it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, we want the exact same thing on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. And one of the advantages here is that, you know, within Puppet, we take advantage that we can use repos. So as we move forward, we basically say, all right, you know, Puppet has a whole other module that we're using where we define what all of our repos are, and then the repos are all puppetized. And as we move through the MySQL module, and you, you'll see some later on the slides, we will show you that we're actually realizing these repos, bringing them into light inside of the system so that the system can take advantage of these things, and we never have to touch a repository ourselves for anything other than just adding a package to it for the private repos. But those repos then again become a dependency, right? So you can't actually install a package. You can't install Percona Toolkit unless you are, you're dependent on having realized that repository. So we've actually made some internal ones. The software for conversion are dependencies themselves, right? If you want to install um, MySQL client, you kind of have to know what you're using. Are you using MariaDB? Then you want to install MariaDB client. If you're using Percona Server, you want to use Percona Server client. So the fork and version determine the repo, right? So what, if you're gonna use MariaDB, you're gonna use that repo. Um, they also determine what package you're gonna use. Um, and they also determine the service name. So for example, the service name might be MySQL, it might be MySQL D, it might be MySQL D.server. We've used, or MySQL.server. Um, it's all there. So let's start to get into some variables. We have some package type variables in our Puppet module. And these are used when we instantiate it. So basically what we have is we'll have a node and we'll say, okay, if, you, if your host name is this, we're just gonna assign you a variable. And this, this is one of the kind of manual parts of it where we say, okay, you, you're gonna be MariaDB. You, you're gonna be MySQL 5.6. And that's really just what we have. These are, this is straight from what we have. We have just a string. So MySQL was the kind of default one and it was MySQL 5.0. We don't have 5.0 anywhere anymore. Um, so we'll probably get rid of that, but that's our default package right now. But everything you know, has its own package type of mostly Maria 5.5 and MySQL 5.6.
And then as you move on, you know, we're kind of basically showing the demonstration. So we're, we're moving into the files so you can see how things look. And right now, this is the designation in our system for what a package type is. Uh, so this line of code here will tell you the packages are defined by these package types. We have MySQL 5.6, which points to, you know, packages that with MySQL server 5.6.12 in the name. And that's where we have a private repository for it. MariaDB will look for packages that are named MariaDB-server. Uh, Percona 5.5, we'll look for Percona Server 5.5, etc., all the way down through each of our different packages. So we talked about service names. So MySQL 5.6 service name is MySQL. Um, all of these are service names are MySQL. Toku text is MySQL.server, and MySQL 5.0s was actually MySQL D. The good news is, is that uh, that's an entire file. That's one class file we have. It's, it's our settings class, which in Puppet is a settings.pp class. So if you went and you went to the GitHub site and you downloaded the settings.pp file, it just, it was those blocks of code. So instantiation I've talked about for a second, in Puppet that's actually called a manifest, so we'll probably use that kind of interchangeably. That's what happens when you call the module. So here's something directly copied from our thing. You can, if you know anything about regular expressions, that's basically saying dev1 and dev2. If, you're, if your host name is this, if you match it, then run this code. And uh, the first thing we do is give it a package type. Now, this is not actually instantiating the settings because you don't see anything that says settings. That's just setting the variable there. Um, that happens inside of other classes, and we'll get to those. All right, and then we look at our client packages. So we have, uh, you know, as we just went through the server.pp, next up is the client.pp. Uh, Basically, that's going to go through and show us everything, what, how we install a client and how we get those packages necessary. Uh, we separate it out because we, sometimes we only want a server to be an admin node or sometimes we only want it to be able to just have MySQL to, to read from other servers but not necessarily have the server on it. So that's why we've separated client and server out. And effectively, it gives us the ability to just install the MySQL packages based upon the package type we've chosen. Yeah, so sometimes developers also need the libraries uh, or sometimes you want to debug something on a development machine and they don't, have the, they don't have the libraries and you want to be able to type MySQL, like can I get to the MySQL instance from this dev machine, you kind of need to type MySQL and you could just look to see if the port's open, but it's better to do it that way. Here's some code. Um, no matter what, we, we install the Percona toolkit, we also install the MySQL utilities, so no matter what, we're going to need to realize the M repo. And this is where we get the MySQL settings package type. Remember in settings we had a package type, right? So basically all we're, we're saying is, this is a case statement, the question mark is a case statement, right? So check the MySQL settings package type and set the value of client package name based on that. So note that we're calling settings class there. We're not, we still haven't installed any package yet, right? We're just still setting arrays right now. Um, and settings that PP does the same, it just sets arrays. So, you know, if you're a MySQL 5.6, we're gonna want you to install this in client. MySQL client 5.6.12, MySQL shared compat, MySQL shared. If you're Percona, same thing, client and shared compat. If you're MariaDB, you know, you install these things, and there's, you know, there's other ones for TokuDB. So you want to make sure that you're installing, the, these are the client libraries. So it's client, dot, that's our client class. And then the default is just MySQL. And so as you see, we're going through all the different packages. The question really becomes, okay, so where do we get all these packages from? And it's basically how we've mentioned earlier. We've defined the repos. Uh, that's mentioned in another class. Some of the gotchas that we'll encounter are, for example, you know, MySQL versus MariaDB. We want to make sure that when you install the server for one, you're installing all the client packages for that particular same model. And that's why it's important that we have the settings.pp designating each package type so that we can say this server is MySQL 5.6 and it'll just know to put everything 5.6 on there as it moves forward when we, based upon how we instantiate it. And you'll see later one of the dependencies for MySQL 5.6 is to remove the MariaDB repo. Because if you try to install the MySQL client, it will say, oh yeah, no, I know what you want. You want the MariaDB client. And it's like, no, we, we don't. We want the MySQL client. So we actually have to remove, um, that's a dependency. So we have to actually ensure that it's not there. All right, so where do we get our packages from? Basically, if you look in that scenario, we've told it that if the package type is MySQL 5.6, we're realizing the um, repo to make sure that MariaDB is not there so that we know that we're only getting the things. And then we're telling it to make sure that Mozilla MySQL, which is one of our private uh, systems hosting five, our 5.6 packages, is there. And it's really that simple. And again, no matter what kind of configuration management tool you use, whether you've written your own or whatever, this kind of logic of like, okay, we need to do that. I mean, you learn that the hard way the first time when you go and install it for the first time manually and you say, okay, what do I need? You're like, oh, I can't do that. If it's MariaDB 5.5, just realize the Maria repo. We don't have to remove a Percona repo. Or we don't have to remove a MySQL repo just because we're doing that, because they, there's not that conflict. 
Um, and the Bracona re repo is already realized. Now we just saw the code to set up the repo, which we call realizing the repo. Um, to be safe, we want to require the repo. And it, this is a lot of setup work to, before we're getting to the meat of like actually installing the package. But the problem is if you don't do this, then you're never going to get the package installed. Um, so we're going to include Bracona's repo and repos are dependencies for installation. The package of client package name, so that's the variable. That's just the name of it. Anything like that before a colon there is just kind of the name of it. Um, when you have, a, you have like package parentheses, that's just the name. So you want to ensure that it's present. This is the meat of it. This is what installs the package. This little ensure equals present with, in the package block there. That's what ensures that it's there. Um, and client package name is the array that we set pre previously, right, with the client packages. So this is what actually installs those client shared client libraries. And so as we look at the different requirements for installation, you know, she, she went over the ensure present real quick. And then it's basically going over what else are we going to require. So we want to make sure that it's present, but we also want to require it. We want to make sure that it's physically there and mandated to be behind before we start moving forward and trying to roll out any of the different packages. And so, for example, for MySQL 5.6, we're making sure that the Mozilla MySQL repo is there. And this is what this is, is this is a safety check. We've already told it to realize it so that it understands that it's there. This is a safety check to say not only did we realize it, but we make sure that it's there before we continue and start trying to move forward with the system. Yeah, never assume ordering, especially in Puppet. So um, installing packages globally. So for example, we're installing all the packages globally. So this is in our client. Any machine that we designate that as a client, that we want to be a client machine, we're like, just put Percona Extra Backup on it. That's what we want. Just put the Percona Toolkit on it, right? And so we're requiring, we're requiring the packages there, but it's, we just want to install it everywhere. We might, use it, we might not use it everywhere, but we want to install it everywhere. And one of the cool points I'll bring up on this slide real fast, uh, what you notice right there where it says Percona Toolkit Ensure 2.1.8-1, you can explicitly require specific versions. The, version, the values for Ensure are basically absent, present, or a specific version. So you can make sure, for example, if you want to stay on a specific version of a hardware, yet you know that the repos that you have out there may update that package at some point. If you want to stay on that one version, so that, and most people do for stability because new stuff may sometimes break things, you can ensure a specific version and say, ensure this number. Right. So that very boring class was our client class. Um, well, ours has some code about setting a root password if the cluster isn't defined. So we give everything a cluster name. And so every cl everything in the cluster should have the same root password. So if the cluster's not defined and a dot my dot cnf root file doesn't exist, then it will actually just go ahead and make a new randomized password and set a, my, a dot my dot cnf, which is kind of neat. So the big guns, um, the server class, which is server.pp, um, it's similar logic to client.pp, but a lot more stuff. Um, and all of our things have already been uh, kind of realized, so there's not a lot of more busy work. A lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about now is actual real stuff that might be interesting. Um, like the client packages, server packages, um, you know, they have requirements, they have that kind of stuff, but there's more logic and dependencies there. Um, files, so what files and directories are all on all servers? You know, we might have like varlib MySQL, we might have some global scripts, right? What might you run on everything? Just like we have the Percona Toolkit, if we have any tools that we've written, we might want those um, there. Uh, varlib MySQL, varlog MySQL, var run MySQLD, we put these just in, and we just make them that every single server we have makes these directories. Now, it doesn't necessarily put anything in them, but in the config file, we know that we can put things in varlib MySQL if we want. Your mileage may, may vary. You may decide that if something has a certain operating system, it's going to have different directories. Maybe if you're using Ubuntu, you want to in like user lib MySQL or something. That's up to you, um, and it's easy enough to do with variables. You might have an authorized keys file that you want globally on all your MySQL servers. This is where you'd put it in server.pp. Um, Etsy security limits.d, file prop limits if you want to use those, um, that kind of thing. The server class is a lot bigger because it solves more pro problems. So we showed all the packages. We showed about files and directories if you just want to put them in and to call them I'm not gonna we're not gonna worry about showing you the syntax of calling files and directories because that's a standard in puppet and in all your configuration management tools so I'm not gonna we're not gonna go through that because we only have so many um, so many times but let's let's take the next biggest thing other than installing right is configuration files. <laughs> and dealing with the my.cnf files. And something I'll point out real quick. So everything you guys have seen up to this point, the settings.pp, the client.pp, the server.pp, these are not something you're messing with every day. 
These are the way that you build out your package so that your infrastructure can scale, can grow, and deploy the things that you need to do. The only times we're really touching these is when we're adding new features or when a new version of some kind of MySQL comes out that we want to upgrade to. It's not something we're messing with daily. This is the, this is the baseline so that the configuration files are the things that really define your infrastructure. Right. The two most recent changes we did were putting stuff in for MySQL 5.6 and putting stuff in for we wanted the MySQL utilities to be yep. put everywhere. Um, actually, that's not true. I installed perf everywhere. Oh. The, the perf tool. Well, look at you. <laughs> Except I couldn't do it everywhere because it's only... So perf is actually a really cool tool, and uh, maybe during the break we'll show you what it can do. Um, but if you've ever used things like Enotop and MyTop, like perf is just way better. Um, and it's, it's performance metrics, but it's, it's not a MySQL specific package, but it really helps you a lot. It helps you find... Yeah. Um, to give you an idea, perf is a tool uh, that basically digs into what system call is each topic that you're using or each process using. So you can actually run perf against a MySQL thread and you can see, hey, it's having problems with locking on NODB versus just saying, okay, this thread's in a query state and I don't know what's going on. Right, and I saw it and I said, I want that on every single one of my servers. And so I put it on every single one of my servers, although I realized that it's only on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, not 5. So um, I, I have a little line of code that says, if you're on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, install perf. I put it in the file and you know the next time Puppet ran, everyone got perf that needed it. So your configuration file, so there's a bunch of different things you can do in a configuration file. You can hard code a standard. For example, our data directory is hard coded. You may not choose to do that, but we have. You can have defaults with override. We have a default expire logs days of 10 days. Sometimes we override that for systems. Maybe we override it temporarily, maybe we override it permanently. Um, so we kind of have a hard code, but you can, you can override it. Then we also have overrides, um, so yeah, overrides for things that change. We do try to have sane defaults, um, and our sane defaults, we try to base them on, on hardware when we can, so again, 75% of RAM. Instead of just saying, oh, one gig for the you know, buffer pool, we use 75% of RAM, although I think it's actually 50% of RAM in our, in our thing. Um, can be based on RAM, battery back write cache, and all of these are, are um, actually defined in server.pp, the variables, they're put into a template. So basically server.pp will call a template and that template will take all the variables and do the right thing. And so as we kind of move into that, looking at that, we pass all these variables through server.pp and one of those variables that we just talked about is the my.conf. Uh, Puppet, you can have what's called a .erb file, which is your template. Uh, so this looks at, for anything that goes into etsy my.conf, it'll pull forward and it'll give us, okay, the owner's gonna be MySQL, the group is gonna be MySQL, because that's standard across all of our servers. You know, the content is going to be the template, which is, if you've already downloaded the Puppet class from us, you'll see that inside of the templates folder for MySQL 2. Uh, there's a my.conf.erb. We, we call it MySQL 2, but we've changed to MySQL in the, in the other one, so that's a typo. So you'll see the my.conf.erb, which looks just like a my.conf with the exception of you'll see a bunch of variable strings in there uh, where you'll see percent signs. Anytime you see a percent sign, that's the indication of that there's a templatized item right there. Right, and it's a, it's a Ruby template. So if, you're, if ERB is sounding familiar or percents are sounding familiar, it's Ruby. Um, and so now here's something interesting, right? We have a dependency. The my.cnf file is dependent on having the packages in, that you've set, right? So why bother having a my.cnf file if you haven't actually installed MySQL? We don't do that. Um, and make sure that it happens before the service name, right? So don't start up the service name before you have the my.conf in place. Otherwise, what happens is you end up making things like the log file size and the enodb the first time you spin up MySQL and it creates the IV data file, right? That's gonna be a certain size based on what's in the configuration file. So we, we actually do it before the service starts up for the first time. So let's get to the fun part. All right, so as we look, basically, this is what you're going to see literally in our ERB file. This is what it looks like. So what you're going to see on the slide and the next few slides kind of show you exactly what we see. So hard-coded variables, the MySQL D, that's not going to change. Everybody has to have that server designation. The data dir, the socket, you know, the, the buffer pool location, the NODB file per table, things like that. And then you start to look at things that are variable based. So remember what I said, anytime we see a percent sign, we see something that came off of a variable. Um, inside of our server.pp, um, we have a section that reads to determine whether the, the server role, and we determine our roles as either master or slave. We're very simple at Mozilla, so it's No, there's just... master, master. Oh, you have master, master? Yeah, okay. we master, 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 um, and that's just a string, by the way. Server role is just a string that we, that we say, and that is another one of the things that's manual, right? So one of the manual things is, hey, if you're a dev machine, we've decided you get MySQL 5.6, and if you're a dev machine, you know, if you're a dev 1, we decide that you're the master, and if you're dev 2, we decide you're the slave. So when we fail over, we change puppet to say what's a master, what's a slave. Um, and then we don't have to deal with changing all these things. 
Yeah. And it's actually pretty cool. It just basically you can say if it's that set read only equal on. If it's not set read only equals off, which is great for when we want to do our failovers, uh, because all we have to do is go into Puppet, change the role, and then and force Puppet to refresh, and then do our failover. And it's that simple. Um, we actually have, so the question is, what if we need to run multiple instances? And the answer is, we, we have a way to do that, and you, why don't you talk to us afterwards, because um, right now we do it on our backup instances, so it's called backups, and we actually want to just change the name to things like cluster. Um, but we do have a way to do it. The way that we do it is we have a separate my.cnf file for every instance and run it on a different local socket. Um, there's no reason you couldn't do this for a MySQL multi. you know? Um, you just have to figure out how do you want that kind of multi-array logic there. And we have one way that we do it, We can, and you guys can do it. Actually, I think we do talk about backups a little bit, don't we? We do get into it towards the end. But uh, I think we're going to run out of time. There's just a lot. There's too much to talk about, really. Um, so quickly, we'll just tell, if you have a hard-coded default with override, I told you about expire logs days. So basically, if it's not undefined, then set it to what it's defined to. And otherwise, set it to 10. So very simple. It's going to be 10 unless we change it. And then we have variables that are based on server information. Those kind of things, like for example, the binary log, or you know, we tell it it's looked on this location, and then we'll pick the host name so that we can have it be named after the server. Obviously, we don't want everything to be named bin log. And then of course, there's ones with override. So as we look at the buffer pool size, you know, we tell it that if it's not undefined, then go ahead and use what we have. Otherwise, it uses that memory split, and then it takes it 50%. So we have boom. That's the divided by 2 is the 50% number of megs. Because if you get the memory size, it's in K. We divide it by 1024, that's, that's megs, and we divide it by 2, figuring 50% is enough when we have you know 32 gigabyte servers and stuff like that. Um, that's a pretty good sane default, right? We're not defaulting to 1 gig or anything too small. We're defaulting to something that we may get in trouble later on, but if we do, we have to tune it anyway, as opposed to getting in trouble when you first set up the server. And ideally, I mean, this configuration value that you set when you're defining the server. So we, we've tuned this on all of our servers in our infrastructure. It's just, this is a safe defaults for the scenario where we need to spin up something fast and we don't have time to do the configuration tuning beforehand. Right. N yep. Uh, quick question, if you have like multiple, multiple instances, mm -hmm. you ever have situations where, um, you know, close to the so, by and large, since you guys work closely with your system admins and vice versa, you know at least it's going to, you know, the buffer pool size of your instances are going to be up. Okay, why do you say I want these? There will be an issue. Well, so, the question is how do you, like, you work closely with the system admins to make sure that things like the, you know, the buffer pool size are split evenly? Um, the answer is actually that's configured in the my.cnf, so our system admins have nothing to do with that. If we wanted to change it to 10 instances, that's just a configuration file parameter. We did talk to our sysadmins when we said, hey, we, wanted to, we want to remount these partitions with no A time, no dir A time. Uh, we want um, swappiness to be set low. We, we did consult with them, and they showed us how to do it in Puppet, and so we did it um, because they already know how to do that. Does, that. does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. So what about a more complicated example? What if you have uh, replicate wild ignore tables or something, and you basically, you don't want to have anything unless you have something, but if you have something, it might be an array. So here's something where you, you, you have a, we have something configured that either use the array or none. So now we basically say if replicate wild do table, and we've just, these aren't magic words, replicate wild do table, we just actually named the variable replicate wild do table. We could have called it food, it doesn't matter. Um, and in fact, for a while, we were, we were not naming them the same so that we wouldn't get confused, but then I was like, how would we not get confused? It's the same name as the variable. So, um, so this is what we put in when we instantiate the class, and we'll show you that actually the next slide when we show you the instantiation. Um, so basically, if it's not undefined, meaning it is defined, then what we're going to do is we're going to go through the array that you set and say replicate while do table equals blank, right? As opposed to, and now if we, because with replicate while do table, if you have three things, you need to say it three times. If it was something where you could just give it a comma separated list, we would have just given it the variable. So here's our instantiation. We're going to start with dev12. This is what we showed you before. That's the first thing in it. Um, and so now we have class mysql2 server, and we set some variables. The server role. So even here with the server role, we're saying, okay, what's your, what's your domain name? If your domain name is dev1, you're the master. Otherwise, you're, you're a slave. So now if we have 10 slaves, we only have to change one thing. Now if we change it to the dev3, or dev2, since it's only dev1 and 2, if we change the dev2 to be the master, we change it here. And it will do the right things for us. And this is what I was talking about, where if we want to swap the master over, all we have to do is change just one line in Puppet, push it out, 
make sure it's taken effect, and then just go right. from there. And we monitor things, right? So if uh, read-only is set to on, and it's supposed to be set to off, um, it will get paged within five minutes. So here's some things, you know, here's a cluster name. You know, we've set the inner view for full size to be eight gigs. We've set the bin log format to be mixed. Expire logs days is seven. Wait timeouts 120. Key buffer size. We didn't show you these things, but a lot of these are, if it's not defined, either have a same default, or if it is not defined, don't define it all, and use the regular default with MySQL. Is that it? And that, and swappiness is 30. Question? Do you have values that tell you so the question is, do we have a NIOS, uh, do we NIOS alert on the Puppet runs? Um, the answer is we monitor the Puppet runs, but not with NIOS, because we got a page every single time, or our poor SREs got a page every single time Puppet failed, they would be sad pandas, so. Yeah, there's a lot, because imagine when you roll out a, a change, and it, it works just fine when you did it manually, but then you go to roll it out to 100 servers on Puppet, and it goes, but the Puppet breaks, so it'll, you know, page 500 servers, that wouldn't be so fun. We have a good relationship with our SREs, and we want to keep it that way. So, <laughs> the, the answer is you can, and we, we do, actually, we do have uh, monitoring on it, so that if something um, isn't fresh, we do have a Puppet freshness, so yes. if something isn't, hasn't run Puppet for a little while, because it, because it failed, yeah. we do, we do um, I think somebody gets an email or something. Yeah, but we, also, yeah. Well, we also have a couple people who their job is basically puppet administrators, uh, and right. they have a dashboard that they look at that shows them a list of all the errors. Uh, and we can actually look at that dashboard ourselves, uh, and it can classify right. down very server. Question. So do you guys run puppet manually every time you have a push it up, or do you have a run interval that checks? So uh, the question is, when we want a new change, what do we do with puppet? It's automated. It runs out every half hour. If we need it to go faster than every half hour. I, I have a little script on the jump host that just says run puppet. So basically every five minutes, um, the puppet hosts get the new configuration from the repository. And then every half an hour on every machine, it's run. So we, you, know, you can wait five minutes for it to pull down um, and then just run it manually on the server. Or you can, I just, it's like 20 seconds if I run it manually on the jump host and then and run it on the server. So. Yeah, I mean, the most you're waiting is going to be five minutes. So we do run it manually. Don't, we don't wait the half hour because if there's a problem, you want to know right away. Jeff? How do you test your puppet changes before you roll it out across infrastructure? That's How a great question. How do you test the puppet changes before you roll it out across your infrastructure? Mostly variables, right? If we want to set a variable, if we want to set something to be on every single server, we don't just say, oh, put it in the server.pp and just run it because we're not that great. What we'll do is we'll set up a variable that says, if flag equals yes, then run it. And then we take away the flag when it runs fine. And then we can give it to one server, 10 servers, and then be done with it. Yeah. So as you notice, the, the dev was our example here. Dev gets a lot of flags because we'll, we'll build something out and we'll say, OK, you know, we, we've tested it manually. We now want to test it in Puppet. So we go from here and we add a new flag to dev that says, test this change. And then in the code for that change, we say, don't run this unless it has the flag test for this change. So the dev will have this flag. We run it, puppetize it, it pushes out, and we make sure that the Puppet run succeeded. Right. To be fair. Um, that's up to us, and that's on us. So, you know, I might tell you that when I was doing perf, I actually did install it everywhere, and that's how I found out the hardware, because I was looking at the, I was actually looking at the page that shows you the puppet failures and seeing it grow, and I was like, oh, that's probably me. We usually do it, um, and sometimes we don't, but never on Fridays. <laughs> so do we miss any logic for this my.cnf file? Is there anything that you think, if you had this system in place, is there anything in your my.cnf files that you think you could not do? I'm sorry? Create a server ID. Oh, that's great. You know, I didn't put that in there. And the reason why is because we actually have a function that goes and makes a server ID based on um, the host name, I think it yep, is. It's the host name. It's based on the host name. And we weren't ready to release that because it's not in the right place in our puppet system. So what we have is we actually have um, server ID. We never override that. It's just set by Puppet, but there's no reason we couldn't make it a variable. Um, so yeah, we just have a function that's in Puppet, and it runs the function. Um, so it actually says in the template, like, there's no variable because we don't override it. But in the my.cnf.erb, it says run this function. Yeah, and, and what you'll see there is what we do is I think we generate a five or six digit number basically using the server name, the FQDN as a seed, so right. that we get a unique server name every time. But it's just called like get node ID. Yeah. So it's not really a very, I haven't looked into like what it actually does because it works and I'm not touching it. It's easy to clone a server's configuration exactly um, or for a different cluster. Once you install it, Um, you made that change, um, this 
server? Right. So the question is, what if what if you want to change something and the server's running for six months? Yeah, we change it in Puppet, and it changes the MyNotCNF file. Now we also have a class to change the right variable now, if we want. Once you change it, how do you push it? It pushes automatically. So Puppet runs every half hour, and there the Puppet administrative servers take the change from the SVN repository. So we have to commit the change, and then if the change gets propagated out to the Puppet administration uh, servers, and then the servers themselves run Puppet every half hour. Yeah, and so this is where it, it kind of comes into two folds because as you know, there's changes that you can make that take effect on a server that you can do live, and then there's those changes that require a service restart. Uh, so we have PT config diff running at all times as an Agios check, and so if the etsy.my.conf ever differs for something that is the server, it's going to alert us and let us know, hey, you made this change, it, Puppet pushed it, but it's not taking effect on the server, and whether it's a local one or otherwise, we can just make sure to run the command to right. set so it or to restart run the service. Out of disk space, we purge some binary logs, we set expire logs days to 7 instead of 10, but we forget to change it in the my.cnf. We've just set it on the server because it's 3 in the morning and we're not thinking. Five minutes later we get a page saying, hey, your configuration is different from your my.cnf. Does that answer your question about how it gets pushed out? No, I just, the, 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 okay. No, you don't yep. have to restart my SQL. Yeah, no, we don't, we, and exactly, that's why that's still a manual process, is we don't have it actually doing any kind of restarts on our services. That would be kind of a scary thought. Back, yeah. um, so what we do is, again, we just have the PT config diff monitoring that, and it'll alert us and say, okay, this change is in the etsy.my.cnf, so it'll take effect on next reboot, uh, but it's not in the current system. So it, it lets us know, and it will flag us and alert we us. We actually about. have a class that we don't use yeah. called variable, which we're, we're, we'll talk about here that will set a variable. Yep. So you, we can actually do it all in Puppet to say change the my.cnf and oh by the way change the running variable. Okay. So we'll, we'll actually see that. Let's let's uh, let's move on. If you have some questions that we haven't answered yet, write them down and we'll definitely get to them at the end. So it's easy to exactly clone a server's configuration or for a different cluster because you can just copy and paste that instantiation and to change dev to stage or whatever you want um, and change whatever the variables uh, you want are. Um, we do have some multi-purpose variables. Um, server role is one of them. So you saw that server role we set to master slave or master master. Um, it sets the read only variable in my.cnf, which you saw. Um, but it is also used in setting Etsy Monty, right? So Etsy Monty, the message of the day when you log in, that's, that's something that's, uh, that's shown. And Etsy is the place it's in on, on Red Hat, which is what we use. Um, and so we actually have something that says, and we use cluster. You saw cluster equals dev. Um, cluster is also used in setting Etsy Monty. Um, and it's also setting um, if the cluster exists, we talked about if you don't have a .my.cnf and the cluster is not defined, then give it a new password. Um, so what does our Etsy Mati look like? It actually looks like MySQL server role for cluster. So we'll actually say when you log in, and this was asked for by our, by our SREs, that this is a MySQL slave for dev. That's what it says. So you never have to worry, assuming you've done your failover write and done it in Puppet, you never have to worry and tell people, oh wait, we're now on dev one is the slave and dev two is the master. They log in, they see it. Which um, is really fun, because we have a couple servers where, for example, it was two systems and now it's three, and the third one is the master. So you log in and it says, on generic three, for example, it says, this is the master master, this is the master server for generic. And then you look at the one and it says, this is a slave server for generic. It's really handy when you're differing with server numbers that usually one is the master. Also on our multi-clusters, where we have more than one thing running, in the, in the message of the day, it shows you how to log into it, because we use sockets. So you have to log in as root, and you have to say, you know, uh, MySQL dash capital S this socket. So we actually list out each instance, right? For the for the dev backup instance, you do it with you know varlet MySQL dev .soc, so that our SREs can log in without having to worry about without having to really know MySQL. They can log in, run a couple commands that we've explained how to do. Um, so the operating system configuration, I think we've already mentioned this. We call other classes, right? So it's not a MySQL thing to set the swappiness. So we actually call, we have a sysctl class, and we set a value in that class. VM swappiness is whatever swappiness is. That's how we do it. And of course, that depends on if the other classes exist. So if you download our stuff and you don't have a sysctl, I don't remember if we put it in the module or not, um, you know, we're not, I don't think we have that open either. Um, so you have, to, you have to know how that's going. And if we don't have a class yet, this we just recently did this, we wanted to mount things no A time, no dura time so that we'd get a little better performance, we did it manually in the instantiation. So what we've done is, you've seen this, we, we actually have a mount slash, so we actually have our data directory on slash, 
We know, we know. Um, so ensure mount it is true, at boot is, um, ensure mount and add, add boot true. So mount is one of these things like file and package and puppet that they give you. So it's basically making sure that before you have the server, right, this is mounted. Um, and here are the options, right? So here's your no, no A time, no duray time, variable zero, remount read only uh, on that certain device. And this is in the instantiation. So this is very manual. Um, and it's a hack. I'll say that. It's a hack. But you know what? Now we have every single one of our servers that has no duration time on it. And we didn't have to wait for our sysadmins to like write the right thing. Um, or we didn't have to wait for us to write the right thing. And so, that's, that's kind of yeah. the beauty of the whole system here with Puppet too. is there are things that you can do manually that way, but it's still puppetized. Granted, we're, we're moving towards being able to write a bigger and better class for this, but the, we discussed, you know, we want the, the change more effectively than we need the time to do the class. Right. It didn't take long to go through that puppet file and for all of our server designations, because they're all done out through, you know, effectively regular expressions that way for all the servers in a block, it wasn't long to just add that mount block in every section of the config file, it took probably 20, 30 minutes. Right, and notice we have regular expressions on our cluster, right? So we have hundreds of machines, but we only have dozens of clusters. So we only had to, had to um, change a couple of dozen of these. If you have a million machines and four clusters, you only have to change four things. Now, if your hardware is different, right, we, we, we knew that it was gonna be on dev SDA3 for all of our machines in the dev cluster. So we could do that. If your machines are different, you might have some more variables. It might be a little more, you know, crazy and manual. But um, it's definitely hacked. It's another seven lines for each node description. And again, if you have four different clusters in a million nodes, that's not that many lines. We have something like 25, 26 different uh, clusters. So that's a lot of more lines in, in files. Um, but it's better than nothing. It's better than not having it. Because now we have it and now it's there and it's not going to go away. And when we spin up a new server and we copy and paste that whole instantiation, we're going to copy and paste that too. So yeah, it's just barely better than nothing, but it's there. Um, and it's short term, right? Or maybe medium term until we have a separate class for it. Um, so someone asked about uh, grants. I don't know if he's actually still here or not, but the grant statement in MySQL has seven different parameters. Right, privilege, so you've got a list of privileges, you've got a database, a table name, a user, a host, identified by the password, and then if you use with grant option or not. So we just have a very dumb class, right, that just, you set all of these different seven variables and it runs the grant statement. Um, and then we also have one more, an eighth variable for revoke. Um, and the neat part about this class is not just that um, it'll run it and it's dumb, because that's, that's fine, but um, what it does is it will execute the grant, um, which is the command is mysql-e. This is like you might even be typing it on command line. Um, revoke, so this is if the revoke flag is set, we want to revoke it. So revoke privileges um, and whether or not you use with grant option um, on database.tables from username at host and then flush privileges. That's not the cool part. The cool part is here, only if it actually exists. So only if the show grants for username at host matches grant privileges on whatever. So we're actually saying run the revoke command. We could have just said run the revoke command. There's no harm in running a revoke command on a user that doesn't exist, except they're using resources. So we put this little thing in it and it checks, it does show grants, checks, and then if it exists, it removes it. And boy, was it a pain trying to quote and escape everything. That took a while. <laughs> um, and we require that MySQL is running. So if MySQL is not running, it doesn't bother to try to do these grant revokes. Otherwise, you get a ton of errors. If you try to grant 17 different things, like we, we have a monitoring user, and we have a couple different machines it comes from. So if you have like 10 machines it, come, it comes from, and you run the grant 10 times, you get 10 errors if you don't do that. This, by the way, makes it fantastic when a password for a Nagios user gets determined or somebody pasted into an IRC chat, which did happen, by the way, earlier this it year. Happens. They had to change the password, or and all we had leaves. to do was you just... Have to, you know, somebody from the, from, you know, from the yeah. team leaves, you have to change it. You yeah. change it in one place, and it grants everybody. Yeah, it. hit the entire infrastructure and all of our infrastructure just by adding this right. one you can class revoke, and go. You can revoke, let's say someone who has accounts on your system leaves. You can revoke their account on every single server, whether it exists or not. You don't, you don't have to be like, well, do they have dev and stage? You don't have to worry about it. You just revoke it. You're done. Um, so else, remember this is the revoke. If the revoke is set, if the revoke isn't set, just run the grant. MySQL dash e grant privileges on database.tables to username and host identified by flush privileges unless, and again, the unless is the same thing, unless it already exists. So there's no duplication of efforts here. And again, require that MySQL is actually running. 
So the grants class does one thing, does it well, it's called in other classes, right? You can call it from your instantiation or you can call it from other classes. For example, server.pp calls it for the monitoring user because anything that's a server is going to have to be monitored. And you can also call on the instantiation. Or the Nagios module does a call to MySQL to grants. Right. And now MySQL introduces new privileges, it's ready. Right? When MySQL introduced the trigger privilege, because it's just a variable, we didn't have to tweak anything for it to work. So I imagine behind the scenes you're, you can enforce your uh, password tools so that when you are doing the grants or whatever, whatever the password is, at least consistent with whatever you're So the comment is, this is one way that you can enforce password rules. Sure, if you really wanted to, you could set up some kind of re repository that has old passwords and nobody reuses them or you can have some kind of function to, to check other passwords, right? Make sure you're not using the same password as the username. Um, or, you can do that. Or if you require, I'm just pointing that out here. Yeah, and, and to bear in mind, everything that's here is just what we've written. It can all be expanded on. So for example, if you went to 5.6 and you wanted to use all the new password stuff, like the password security in 5.6, you could rewrite this grant class, add a few smarter things to it so that it could learn from okay, this password existed before, et cetera, things that MySQL has internally. You could make this class learn from that and then adjust. Um, so the grants class is called in the server class for, for global users and we, you can instantiate it for groups. So let's say, we haven't done this yet, but this is one of the things that we will eventually do, right? For the dev server, for the app, dev application, you can put it in Agios, right? There's no reason to do that, right? They should work. Um, we just haven't gotten with our developers and, you know, made that okay. And here we go. The, the big thing that we want to see across the entirety of the infrastructure is one word, consistency. We want to make sure that when we make this change, it goes out to everything. It affects everything equally. Everything is simple, easy, and stupid. Yep. It's just that simple. It's easy to do. If we have a junior DBA come in, they can look at that instantiation and copy and paste it and know what they're doing. Everything is it's readable. It's obvious. They may not know why we set you know, the key buffer to one gig. And they might be like, well, we're not using my ISMR. We're like, well, on this server, we are. Uh, but but they'll it'll be very clear. Like you can make it exactly the same or similar. You spin up a new instance. So a stage user stage might have a stage user. So you can copy paste if you want exact, or you can copy paste and edit, or you can just change the node. If we if we spin up dev three, all we have to do is instead of one or two, we just put one through three, and we're done. That's it. We run puppet. We're done. I mean, we still have to back up and restore and and make it have the data. Um, we have a database class to make sure that a database exists. It's very simple. Um, and here's the code. Um, exec create whatever the name of the database is, unless um, if, if you do MySQL database name, let's say your database name is checksum. So if you run MySQL checksum and that's true, there's no need to create the database, right? If you do MySQL checksum and it says error, no such database, you need to create the database. So it's pretty simple. Um, so then you do MySQL-E, create database name. And there are some things that, I'm, that we're leaving out of this. We're leaving out of the paths Right, and the environment, and again, require that MySQL is running. So we didn't show you things like path before with the grants one, because that was pretty big. Um, but you can see that we have a path there, the environment. So it's not, we're not just running MySQL without any path. So interestingly enough, with the database class, um, you can add a user to it, right? So if you're making a checksum database, don't you think you have a checksum user? Probably. Um, so this is part of the code. If the username is not defined and the password is not defined, is not undefined, right? So if you've defined a user and you've found a password, call the grant class. And this is how you call it. So somebody asked about, do we put passwords in it? No, we use Hira. Um, I've just put dollar sign password here because really it's for us, it's like Hira colon colon, whatever it is. So there's the database. So it'll actually, this is, our, our database class is hard coded to say grant all on, you know, on the database for this user. Um, so you can also add host, grant privileges, other variables, but by default it'll just give all the variables to it. So if we wanted to change something, one of the things I've been wanting to do is put report host and report port on all our servers. And I have it in there uncommented, so here's another thing you can do, um, is put it uncommented. So I put it uncommented to make sure it would be fine, you know, that I wasn't messing anything up in a my.cnf. Um, so to ensure a runtime variable, we have a variable class. It requires that the service is running, um, and here's what it does. If you define MySQL to variable value, you execute mysql e set global name equals value. Boom. And we could have probably even made global a variable so you could set the session. But the idea is if we wanted to set report port or report host, uh, I think that's a static variable, so it might not be a good idea. But if we're changing expire logs days, for example, we can actually put something in the puppet run 
to actually, or in the um, instantiation that says, you know, variable expire logs A is equal seven, we wouldn't even have to touch the machine. Um, unless um, the show variables like exists, it already has that value. That's all that's doing. And a perfect example of this as we move forward is our slow query log. So as we look at the next slide, we'll go in here, you know, you'll see that the slow query log is something that we, we use this for. So we can effectively say if slow logs is set as a runtime variable, then when MySQL goes on, the slow query log value is on. Otherwise, it's off. It's right. pretty much that simple. Oh, and by the way, the log file name should be uh, the value of that, and the long query time should be the value of long query time. Um, otherwise, set it to off. So you can have more than, you know, this is a little more complicated logic. It's not that complicated. So, you know, we've talked about this already. Um, alert if the runtime versus confile fig is different. We use Nagios combined with PT config but this gives you false negatives because what it what PT config does is it looks at the values that are defined in etsy.my.cnf and the values that are defined in the localhost and matches them up. So if it's not in your etsy.my.cnf, but it's in your localhost, in, you know, in your thing. If you change a default value that you haven't put in my.cnf, it's going to say, oh, you're fine. I guess it's a false positive, not a false positive. Yeah, because you get a positive. You don't get a page. Um, so it, it only kind of works halfway. But if you're doing something like you're failing something over and you forget to change read only, you'll get paged on the one server that is set to read only on that should be off. Um, you won't get paged on the one that's off but should be set to on because it's not set in the, in the thing. So next up we go into scripts. Scripts are something that pretty much every DBA has. The only person in the room who raised their hand that said they didn't was Daniel and he already took off. Right, and he's so, written his own script, yeah. so we, we know Exactly, so every DBA has scripts. I, I broke scripts down into three categories. You effectively have a script, you have a cron that can call the script, or the script itself is its own execution because it's an init script, so it does that server start. Uh, so I broke it down into three categories. That makes every script have one of three flags or even multiples. Uh, it's really easy. It basically took all the pain out of making scripts for all of our servers because we could deploy them out to every database server instantly, and we could make sure that we understand what's a script, what's the cron execution for the script, and then what right. is an init script necessary. We're going to speed it up a little bit because I think we're out of time now. We still have like 20 more slides. Yeah. So basically, it's a big win to have these in version control as well as configuration control. Yeah. Scripts, crons, and ints are all similar. They're a file copied to a location, and there's some optional parameters to be set in instantiation. At Mozilla, we have consistent paths but different paths. For example, etsy cron.d for cron is consistent across all our machines. User local bin for scripts is consistent, and etsy init.d is consistent. And of course, we can always override that with variables. So if in your system, it's different. Um, so here are defaults. So you can override script path, user local bin. Cron path, etsy cron.d. So you can override those. Um, your scripts may vary, and maybe you want to check your operating system release. I was talking before about how we installed Perf. Um, we did it by checking this, right? Operating system is Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Operating system release is six. So defaults to cron plus script, um, meaning that if you don't set any of the flags, it def it def it's going to assume you want a cron script, right? So want script defaults to true, want cron defaults to true, want init defaults to default. At least one of these should be false, so we test for that. If you, it should be true. If all of them are false, we give a warning because what are you going to do? Um, the logic is in script.pp, which is our script class. So if want.script is true, you ensure that the script is present, set the source. So where are you getting it from? Because you copy it from somewhere in Puppet. Um, so that's the template, just the source prefix, which is set earlier, which is module name scripts. So it's in the module. So in the scripts directory, you put the script you want, and it gets copied over to the right place. You set the destination, which is... Um, script path name, so we just, whatever you name it in the scripts directory, that's what it's going to be. If you name it backup underscore MySQL, it's going to .sh or something, it's going to be called that. And it sets the mode to 0755. Yep, and one of the cool things here that I did to kind of templatize things is as every script is just basically named whatever your script name is. When you want a cron for it, just name it the exact same name as the script, you know, dot cron. And then right. the same thing for init with the dot init. And right. so it basically comes out so that it's really simple to identify what's a cron, what's a script, what's an init, because the naming convention already has it. And right. then. So the if you have backup.sh, the cron is going to be called backup.sh.cron. And it's in the crons directory or whatever you want to put it. So here we're setting some variables. We take the variables and set other variables with them. If ensure cron is true, then want cron is going to be present. If not, it's going to be absent. Same thing to want init. With, same thing with want init, with ensure init. Um, and so this is how we call, this is how we make sure it happens. If. Um, if want cron is true, this is it's going to be name.cron, right? And the init location is the same thing. So we just said this. You know, the cron source is script name.cron. And uh, similarly, the init source is script name.init. 
So if you had some kind of MySQL init file, it's going to be MySQL init. Now, you wouldn't have a separate script in that case. That is the script. So if uh, cron or init is not set, it shouldn't exist. So for example, if you have a script on the master and the slave, but it only should run on the master, then um, you're going to do that. So what you have is you have ensure the variable we set, present or absent. So that when you change a master and a slave, you're going to change whether or not it gets the cron for it. The script should still stay there, but the cron isn't going to run on the slave. And the, you know, just setting things, if it's, if you have an init, you want to set it to 755, if it's a cron, 644. A script might need a particular database or user, so you instantiate the script class, the database class, the grant class, right? You can do that. Um, you can have parameters for the script class, or if you have something really complicated, you can make a new class. We actually made a new class for checksums, and we put all this stuff in the class. So it's a style issue. Um, we had parameters being variables. We added a new template. It's just a style issue, right? So we had want cron as a duplicate. It happens to be in the checksum class. We actually have a want cron. Do you want the cron or not? Are you the master? It's a duplicate. It's kind of denormalized. So is it good? Mm, style issue. Um, so we do have some variables for the checksum script. We have the username, password, chunk size limit, ignore tables, password. Um, and this is what it looks like. We have the file user local my, bin mysql checksum.sh is from this template. Um, and the template you know, does a whole bunch of things. Um, more than yeah. once, we can have more than one instance per server. Was, was that you were talking about? More than one instance per server. We actually do it for backups. Um, it doesn't call the server class. It calls what we call the backups class. We should call it the cluster class. Um, it does call settings and client classes because that doesn't change. You still only have one client, and one, this is another reason we separated it, right? We'll still have to install the packages. So when we do go to like MySQL 5.7 or we went to 5.6, we had to change it not only in the set in the server.pp, which packages we're using, but we had to do it in the backups.pp file as well. Um, we did reverse engineer the class from what we had in place. So we have an Etsy config MySQL backup clusters file that has the name of every cluster that we're backing up, and that does everything. Right? That array is the source of truth, and it's populated by an instance variable. So when we instantiate the class, we say, backup one server has these four instances on it, and that does everything. Um, we don't use ports. We use local sockets. So we just say your varlib mysql instance name dot sock. We could do something that has ports as well. The backup scripts use the array, so they just go through the array, and for each one in the array, it does that. Um, the per cluster variables pass the array to a subclass. We have a cluster subclass, so every instance now runs that one. So this is how we get a my.cnf for every single class. So we put it, um, we put it in, uh, so if we have foo bar baz, the subclass is instantiated three times. Our data directory is data foo, right, or data bar or data baz. It'll make all those data directories. That's where the config file is. It's all based on the name of the instance. So it's all kind of magic locations, but it's all done in Puppet so we don't have to worry about it. When we spin up a new backup instance, if we want to move backup locations, it's easy to do. Um, our PID script, aliases, backup locations, and crons. Um, and so that's it. Please give us feedback on, on our GitHub. What? Sorry. The slides are available, yeah, right yeah. there. Public MySQL slides.